been really intense. Uh, there, there's only been three times that I thought about getting out of wildland uh, fire management. One was in 1966 down in Southern California, and uh, it was just on this ridge uh, with the Dalton hotshots and a fire come cruising up through Loop Canyon and, and uh, uh, killed ten people there and two later died in the hospital. And I thought about uh, getting out of wildland fire at that time. The second time was about ten years ago in Arizona on the Dude Fire that when the, the column built up, collapsed and threw fire all over the place. And that, that kind of shook me up. You know, made me really uh, question my, my uh, uh, the passion for uh, wildland fire management. And then the third time was Sierra Grande. Uh, because uh, you have to come face to face with issues on accountability and the reasons you make decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, uh, and, and needless to say, uh, I probably still am super involved with uh, this particular fire because uh, I, I saw it from the, the time it was, uh, Sierra Grande was at bay. And, and when I left, you know, 47,000 acres plus and 200 uh, plus homes destroyed and so forth. And to, to uh, face the fact that there were times that I made decisions that, that possibly uh, led to uh, the eventual outcome of, of this fire. So, but I, I think the spin I want to take on it uh, tonight will be uh, four type three ICs and, and the kind of decisions you make in, in relatively innocent looking fire environment all of a sudden just blowing up right in your face. I want to do it for type three ICs. And then also to share with you some uh, lessons learned on, on prescribed fire. And there's that, that unique, distinct uh, boundary of the park that runs up to the top of Sierra Grande. It comes back down to the south and along this road here, that's State Route 4. And I'll be referring to that one a lot. Uh, a lot of activity along this particular road. The, tops of these mountains, uh, this light area is grassy area, open, open forest areas. And the uh, tops of these mountains here, uh, uh, historically, were wide open. Very few trees on there. Fire is a frequent visitor. I believe the fire, fire return interval to this particular regime was like uh, uh, every five to ten years. This is the south face of Sierra Grande, right in here, uh, kind of in a bowl. And uh, the efforts uh, were to go ahead and to treat the vegetation in here. Since the fire suppression had been actively uh, engaged with in this lower part, both on the La Mesa and uh, uh, fire and on uh, the Dome fire, uh, this part of the mountain hadn't burned in a long time, and it was the parks in the tent to burn that. This is uh, the top of. Sierra Grande Peak, looking down into Frijoles Canyon. This is kind of to the southeast. The canyon drops down here at their state route uh, four, drops down into this part of the canyon, and then it turns left and goes down where the uh, uh, monument is, or I should say where, where the main uh, uh, cliff dwellings are. Uh, right here is where the test fire was began. The, uh, again, that's May 4th at 7.20 in the evening. Uh, we had walked up once uh, earlier in that day, bringing uh, bladder bags and spreading them along this meadow area. Uh, went back down to the road that, that evening, or late afternoon I should say, we uh, picked up a, a Type 2 10-person crew, walked up with them to this point, and uh, the burn organization, myself, the Type uh, 2 uh, uh, 10 person crew all began the test fire right here. There the cell phones as well as radios uh, communicating that we were ready to begin. Uh, the work was in prescription and we were going to get it on. Uh, the plan was to bring fire down along this ridge here coming off the Sierra Grande. It takes a turn and comes back to the south going into this meadow area. And then everything down below here was in that phase one uh, uh, area. Okay, right about this point, uh, uh, that, that's roughly 10.30, 11 o'clock uh, Thursday night, May 4th, uh, we're there. Uh, the burn boss became real concerned about the fatigue level of the Type 2 uh, crew, the 10-person crew. Uh, we continued going 
Vern Boss had planned for that Type 2 crew to stay there past midnight to keep an eye on it, and for the bandolier people, the prescribed fire module, the prescribed fire monitors, and the engine people to go down at midnight to get some rest and to uh, come back up in the morning. Additionally, the burn boss had called uh, earlier Thursday morning and had asked uh, if the contingency resources would be available. In the burn plan, uh, and then this is one of the big lessons, is, is really defining contingency resources and taking it to heart instead of just putting <coughs> down names and numbers. But uh, a burn boss had called dispatch and said, well, do I have uh, a type uh, two crew, two type two crews available uh, between uh, two and three hours from when I say uh, I need help? And uh, the burn boss said that, that the reply was yes, you do have contingency resources available. So we, uh, uh, we brought the fire down to this point. Burn boss said, uh, I, I'm going to release that 10-person uh, crew. Burn boss released the crew. Uh, Burn boss asked me to go ahead and to pick up people that were over here as soon as they had that check. Uh, pick them up and pick people coming up off the hill and to uh, bring them on down to Bandelier. Six o'clock in the morning, uh, I woke up uh, and w went into to the trailer there, which uh, works as their office. And uh, the burn boss was just uh, emotionally and physically shot. And I, and I woke him up and I said, what about the contingency resources? And he said, well, I called. Uh, Three o'clock in the morning, he called and uh, uh, called the dispatcher on duty. The dispatcher on duty said, well, is it a, a wildfire? And the burn boss says no, and the dispatcher said, call me in the morning. That's, a, that's a one story. Uh, that's the story, I, I believe. The, the dispatcher hung up. The burn boss got frustrated, uh, tried a couple other calls to get contingency resources, wasn't able to do so, and, and uh, he crashed. Uh, I woke him up, and I said, no. I, I said, this is going to, it has the potential of causing some problems. You know, we've, we've got limited people. We don't have the contingency resources that you thought would be available within three hours after you said you need them. And so I told him, I says, uh, do me a couple favors. I said, number one, you get a hotshot crew. You know, get a hotshot crew right now. Get a hotshot crew fast. And I says, get a helicopter. Uh, we got Santa Fe hotshot crew in here right around noon. Uh, the hotshot crew walked up the line and started to, to build underslung line on the swap over. And uh, Rich Tingle, the superintendent, uh, right around 12.30 o'clock, <coughs> he phones me and he says, uh, uh, I'm gonna need some air support on this. And uh, I, I said, well, how many drops you need? He says, well, I'm gonna need at least two. He was having problems. Right, right at that time, I, I felt really uncomfortable that this thing uh, it was right on, on the verge of becoming a wildland fire. This is still Friday, you know, less than, less than 24 hours after it was lit. Uh, so I turned to the resource manager and, and I says, well, I would feel best if we declared this a wildland fire and took appropriate management response on it to uh, uh, put it out and, and not to call it a prescribed fire anymore. Declared it a, uh, a wildland fire, went <coughs> through the WUFSA process, took a look at, at two alternatives. As soon as we declared it a wildland fire, uh, I went ahead and ordered up a, a second hotshot crew. Took a look at, at two uh, alternatives. And those of you that have seen the report, uh, I see those alternatives in there. Number uh, one was took a look at going direct along here. Had a lot of benefits uh, associated with it. Uh, one is it would keep the fire size smaller. Uh, two is that possibly, especially in this Aspen, uh, the fire wasn't going to carry. So some sort of scratch line or, or a, a quick control line could be put in there and, and improved as needed. Uh, the disadvantage it has is by the time uh, 
uh, we were able to make a decision on that. The fire was in some of this heavier, bigger stuff, and uh, I was concerned about firefighter safety. Uh, up in the North Cascades in uh, 1990, uh, there was a fire, uh, McAllister Creek, and it was on the side of a hill, and, and the uh, tactics there, the strategy there was to do underslung line. And uh, I engaged in it. Uh, one of the snags uh, cut loose up above, uh, fell, and his limb comes cartwheeling through the air. He hit one of my squad bosses in the chest, sent him to the hospital. Didn't do anything serious to him, but uh, I, I don't, you know, I had a, a preconceived bias against uh, doing underslung lines where, where the potential snags falling uh, existed. So uh, that's, that's, that's uh, one alternative. The second alternative was since there was constructed line, mineral line, all the way down to the road here, and a cut line to this road, we could go ahead and uh, uh, use the existing lines minus about 100 acres here. And, and we were concerned that people would think we were still trying to manage it as a prescribed fire. But, but uh, to use these existing lines and to bring it down to the road to keep firefighters out from underneath uh, a fire. Uh, and I, I brought those two alternatives to the park superintendent and told them that my recommendation based on firefighter safety and, and the, the amount of work that needed to be done was to go with the indirect uh, alternative. Uh, the park superintendent thought about it, went ahead and signed off on that alternative and, and that's what I have started uh, moving towards. That, that's an uh, important decision point. It was about every other week I was down in, in uh, Los Alamos, or at least Santa Fe, uh, I went there and stood, stood among all those burn up cars and houses and, and all that, that human loss and, and tried to uh, really sort through that decision. Would I make that same decision again? And I, and I think I would. I, I think I would. Uh, that Sunday morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, the Mormon Lake brought the fire on down to the road and started burning along this early Sunday morning. Uh, I asked them to stop firing there until we had this line really secure, so our, our plans were to, to hold up the firing operation right there. And my main concern is that we had some unburned fuel uh, up above the road, and I, I didn't want that fire to build up some heat here and come running up this direction. Sunday morning, uh, we put a ping pong machine on the helicopter, and it started, uh, made a couple passes, dropped a, a few balls up in this area to uh, put some uh, strength into this section of line. Then right, right around noon, wind came up. Fire took uh, this area here that we had burned uh, the previous night, started to heat up. The fire moved through this strip of timber over here behind this meadow, over here kind of hopscotch into this area, blew through this timber here, and set itself up in uh, this part of Freeholdies Canyon. And that thing is really, really loaded on fuels. I can see why they didn't want to be burned boss in that. that. That place is still, that place is still uh, a keg of dynamite. I, I pretty much set up that as a trigger point for me, is if, if we started to get fired anywhere down below State Route 4, I was, I was going to ask for help. As uh, a matter of fact, we had discussed that Saturday with all the different agencies. And they said, well, uh, you're going to call for a Type 1 team? And I said, yeah, call for a Type 1 team, but uh, really it's not going to make any difference because if it gets there, it's going to move fast. And Saturday we felt comfortable with that decision. It's, it's kind of strange to, to see it all unwind this way, uh, like, like we are, our, the highest fear is expected. But once it was in there, uh, it threw a spot fire through embers over here on the east side of this face. Uh, now this is uh, at noon. This is at noon on Sunday. So this face has been sitting in the sun. And uh, it got over there around mid-afternoon and then took its uh, the first run at Los Alamos across, across this canyon here. There's, a, there's 100, 150 foot flame lanes. We got both hotshot crews, the Type 2 crew, all the engines, everybody over there uh, on, at Freeholdies Canyon, just had them kegged up until 
could sort through what was happening here. Uh, their, their plan was as soon as uh, the, the fire <coughs> let them have a chance that they would build downhill line, you know, as long as they had LCES and everything else as tight as they could, they'd build a downhill line underneath Free Holies Canyon. And in the meantime, we had uh, the Forest Service uh, the Espanola uh, uh, fire management officer was with us uh, all the preceding days. I asked him if he would be division suit on uh, these spot fires over here. It took Mormon Lake, bumped them over uh, to help with that firing operation, then uh, bumped uh, uh, Santa Fe over there, and we started getting a lot of resources. And uh, I was scared to death of getting somebody hurt. These engines would come in, and, and uh, if I didn't feel comfortable from the gut level on them, I, I said, hey, you park here and just stay. But if they seem like, like they uh, could, could be around some pretty explosive fire behavior, I told them, you know, drive up that road and tie in with operations with Russ Cop. And, and I told them, don't take your eyes off that rear view mirror, because if that wind shifted and started moving uh, more towards the east here, it could put them in some real trouble. So I wanted them really be sensitive to how the explosive of the fire environment they were getting in. Then the third thing is if they felt uncomfortable at all, just turn around and come right back here. That, that uh, you know, uh, by no means were, were they being ordered to uh, uh, go in there, uh, uh, you know, against their own wishes. And, uh, and we did, did put a, uh, uh, some crews in there, fire out those roads, and uh, nobody got hurt. And the reason nobody got hurt was because Russ Kopp and Kevin Joseph are brilliant, excellent firemen, and uh, they were able to, uh, to work in a, a situation like this to keep it together. By uh, Monday morning, uh, when this was turned over to a Type 1 uh, incident management team, uh, we had the fire pretty, pretty much uh, up against uh, Los Alamos Canyon along the road there, and the firing operation along 501 held. And then again, that, that's because we had excellent uh, supervisors and, and two damn good hotshot crews, Santa Fe and, and Mormon Lake, uh, plus uh, a lot of other uh, real cautious, aggressive uh, firefighters. And, and that's another real stressful time was that Sunday afternoon, I did, because a lot of it is over the radio and just seeing the smoke off in the distance. And uh, I was stressed to the max uh, having people go in front of 100, 150 foot uh, flame lanes to, to do a last ditch effort to try to keep the fire from burning into a uh, the National Lab land or into uh, Los Alamos itself. Um, the rest of the story, the, uh, we weren't expecting that wind event. Yeah, that wind event was not forecasted uh, for those kind of wind speeds. When it made us run there, there are some weather stations in the area that were recording up to 50 mile an hour wind speed. Uh, the winds blew Sunday, they, they stayed uh, Stayed out of the, the picture Monday, Tuesday. I was feeling really good because I thought, here's the Type 1 team. We've got this thing buttoned up, and uh, we're just going to mop it up, and, and we'll be done with this thing. Wednesday, uh, the winds blew again. Uh, first, when they blew in this yellow area, it pushed into Los Alamos, went up along the, uh, the west and the north side of town. Uh, that's Wednesday. Uh, Thursday. It spotted over here across the road onto Los Alamos lab and started running through this Pinon uh, Juniper uh, uh, area here as well as continued uh, burning towards the north and, and the east on, onto, uh, uh, onto uh, Pueblo land. That pretty much there is the extent of, uh, of the fire. That's a little bit less uh, than uh, 48,000 acres. It's 
tough to stand accountable uh, for a wildland fire management uh, decision, but I think it's important that we do. Make the best decision you can with the best information you get your hands on. Document it, make sure it, it's uh, uh, within law, within policy, and, and it's within uh, standard guidelines. Uh, that's about, I, I know that isn't much, and, and you guys stand a real good chance, especially with, with uh, the way the fuels are building up and the way the agencies want to get it on with prescribed fire. You stand a real good chance of being in an awkward spot yourself. Uh, but when I started uh, fighting fire in 64, I never thought that, that uh, it would be uh, quite the career that I've gone through. And, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I have a lot of pride in the, the job, and I feel that I, I try to do a good job, but uh, you never know, boy. Uh, so, you know, if there's any, any kind of insight I can pass on, that's, that's what, what uh, I'm doing about it. Um, uh, you know, those poor people uh, lost a lot of stuff in Los Alamos uh, that never can be replaced in a, a, a billion dollars. Uh, is a lot of damn money. Um, but uh, uh, that's kind of where people are at. You know, it's a pretty intense, uh, an intense event, uh, especially when you're right in the damn middle of it. But, uh, uh, you know, you know I, 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 I guess I, that's my position of choice is to, to be in the middle of stuff. I like it there. Lessons learned. Uh, this is really, really important. Uh, uh, and it seems simple and obvious, but, but there's uh, some hidden truth in here that uh, I, I tell you it's, it's one, one lesson that that I'll, I'll never forget, is that all, uh, that prescribed fires are not all created equal. They, they each have their own um, risk associated with them and, and their complexities associated with them. And, and to try to uncover those before the match is lit is important. The, the other one is that uh, interagency-wise, we need to define contingency actions and contingency resources. It's not acceptable whether it's a prescribed fire or wildfire, for one agency to pick up and say, I need some help, and for the other agency to say, call me back at 8 o'clock in the morning when the office is open. That's bullshit. That, that pisses me off. Uh, but I think we've sorted through, I think we've sorted through that. But we need to have an interagency definition for this uh, contingency resources and contingency actions uh, taken. <clears throat> Now, the other one is this idea of complexity and risk. Now, the, the tendency is to meld those two together into a, what they call a project assessment. To me, those are two separate uh, uh, things there. Complexity is a logistical thing. You know, complexity is how hard is it going to be to pull this burn off because of logistics. And risk is the threat that, it, that you have uh, to the resource, to the public, to homes, to whatever, if uh, something goes awry, and uh, I don't, I don't think I'll ever uh, do a prescribed burn again uh, without laying out two vectors. This is for you guys in 490. Without laying out two vectors, uh, each vector representing the worst case conditions uh, on historic records. And you use Fire Family Plus to get this to lay out uh, two of those vectors. Uh, representing the potential fire spread in two operational periods, and, and to use that as as a, a, a mental picture of the worst case scenario, I, I think that's that's a really really imperative. This is the worst case scenario that that we that we experience. The contingency resources aren't there. We get a, a strong wind event on top of that, and uh, uh, we're in we're in trouble. I'll never forget that. You know, watching that thing stream across it. The, the ridge and yeah, yeah, standing out there with the park superintendent trying to uh, f figure out what our next uh, move was. There's no way to get around uh, how uncomfortable it is to stand accountable for your decisions. That, I, I think that is, that's the hardest part is to realize that, that you make decisions, you make decisions there, 
and you do it on the best information that you have at the time, spot weather forecast, input uh, from somebody, uh, you remembering uh, sending somebody to a hospital with, working underneath the snag and head. You work with, uh, you make your decisions based on that, and then to stand accountable for those decisions is tough. It's really, really tough because uh, you, you start second guessing yourself, you start to be introspective, and, uh, and I believe that we need to stand accountable and, you know, for too many years. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about Southern California in the, I'm thinking about Southern California in the mid-60s, fire out along the road, the, the wing kicks up, spots on the other side of the road, you turn around, look, and, and you take out a corner of the neighborhood and you said, well, I tried. You know, uh, that's the way accountability used to be. And it's tough to stand accountable uh, for a wildland fire management uh, decision, but I think it's important that we do. And then I don't, I don't know where you come up with, you know, with the, uh, uh, s s you know, strength to do that because emotionally that's tough. It's real, it's real tough. But uh, I think it's a necessary part of, of making wildland fire management a, a, a profession, a, a real profession. Freeholdies Canyon too, that still is full of dead and down. That thing is still a, 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 a wick. And um, I, I made a proposal to him last summer that I go burn him, especially with that much black line around it. <laughs> no, they, they weren't interested in it. I wonder why. Maybe somebody else bring that proposal, it might work. But they, they weren't ready for it. Other thoughts, questions, concerns? That's it. Thank you for letting me dump on you. So sorry it didn't get, get too heavy. <laughs> uh, see you guys tomorrow.